Sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye. Four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. When the pie was opened, the birds began to sing. Wasn't that a dainty dish to set before the king? On the evening of May 20th, 1895, Wall Street banker Henry W. Poor hosted a dinner party in honor of his friend John Cowden's 10th wedding anniversary. Conspicuously absent from the affair was Mrs. Cowden, who was vacationing in Europe at the time. The party was held at the Manhattan studio of stockbroker and amateur photographer James L. Breeze. Adorning the walls of Breeze's West 16th Street apartment were erotic photographs of young female models in various states of undress. The 32 invited guests were attired in formal evening wear, and upon their heads they wore crowns of gold laurel. The decadent scene was reminiscent of what one might expect to see in the Roman courts of Caligula, or Nero. Throughout the evening, a sumptuous dinner was served in 16 courses, during which guests drank 144 bottles of champagne. It was reported that the cost of the dinner was $110 per plate, or about one-sixth the average annual income of most Americans at the time. Dessert was served at around midnight when six waiters carried an enormous pie into the room and placed it on the table before the guest of honor. Everyone began reciting the song of sixpence. As the head waiter cut into the pie's golden brown crust, a bevy of canary birds flew out revealing a young girl draped in a diaphanous black lace. Cowden rose to assist the girl down from the table. Then he gathered her into his arms and carried her out of the room to the approbation of those present. The story of the dinner party went public five months later when the New York World newspaper published a story about 17-year-old Susie Johnson who had gone missing. Her parents had tried everything to locate her, but the New York City police had little interest in helping with the search. Susie's parents learned from her friends that she'd been a photographer's model and that she was a favorite of James Breeze. They told them about the party, adding that such frolics were commonplace. Susie, they said, was to be the star attraction and was paid handsomely for her services. But more ominously, the night of the party was the last time anyone had seen the girl. Across the country, newspapers printed engravings of Susie emerging from the pie and published the names of the dinner guests. Many of them were luminaries from the world of business, politics, and the arts. Among them were artist Charles Dana Gibson, creator of the Gibson Girls. The inventor and electrical wizard Nikola Tesla was there as was the renowned sculptor Augustus St. Gaudens, whose controversial naked statue of Diana graced the tower of Madison Square Garden. And the garden's famous architect, Stanford White, was the master of ceremonies at the night's festivities. Susie Johnson's plight exposed the depraved nature of New York's bohemian set and outed its members, but she would have to bear the ultimate responsibility for her exploitation and she would forever be known as the girl in the pie. Susie quickly faded from the headlines, and her fate was left a mystery. Over a decade would pass before she was found living in another city under a different name. By then, her youthful features, which had been the inspiration and the beguilement of artists, had faded. She said from the moment she emerged from the pie, her life was never the same. It alienated her from her family, ended her first marriage, kept her from decent employment, and made her an outcast of polite society. While Susie was held up as a cautionary tale of what happens when nice girls stray from happy homes, the men whose gluttonous and carnal appetite she fed so well went unpunished and untarnished by the scandal. Undeterred, they carried on with their midnight escapades, but they were more careful to keep them out of the press they would go on to be heralded and celebrated as the masters of their age.
The entertainment on the rooftop theater of Madison Square Garden that night was a musical farce called Mamselle Champagne. It was the show's premiere and it was shaping up to being a resounding flop as guests began leaving before the second act. Shortly before 11 p.m., a tall, heavy-set man in evening attire strolled in. With short red hair and handlebar mustache, he was easily recognizable as Stanford White, the esteemed architect whose lavish buildings had transformed New York into a city of glittering landmarks. Opened in 1890, Madison Square Garden was his crowning achievement. White was so proud of his creation that he personally rented the entire top floor of its distinctive 300-foot tower. On that Monday night, he mingled with guests, taking time to stop and greet friends. By the time he took his seat at a table near the stage, the performers launched into the show's signature number, a bouncy tune called I Could Love a Million Girls. Moments later, the crack of three gunshots interrupted the frivolity on stage. Most of the audience thought it was part of the show at first, until one of the chorus girls screamed, and then another. Stanford White, who made a vigorous entry only minutes before, suddenly slumped forward onto the table, then tumbled lifelessly to the floor. Standing over him was the shooter, who slowly raised the pistol above his waxen features as a signal that he meant no further harm. His name was Harry Kendall Thaw, scion of a wealthy Pittsburgh family. He gazed wide-eyed across the audience as if looking for a valet to take his gun. As he looked out over the sea of stunned faces, he spoke in a voice so soft that only those closest to him could hear what he said. There was some dispute over his exact words, but it was largely agreed that he said, he ruined my wife, he got what he deserved. When no one stepped forward to disarm him, Thaw took a final satisfied glance at the man he just murdered, then walked calmly to the elevator. Then all hell broke loose. Our walk begins here in the rolling, manicured lawns of Holy Cross Cemetery, where rests the central figure in Stanford White's murder. Making our way to her grave, it's easy to become distracted by the many familiar names we pass along the way. In Section M is the grave of Evelyn Nesbitt, a former model and chorus girl whose beauty graced the pages of magazines and beguiled rich and powerful men. She was the key witness in what was called the trial of the century that exposed the secret lives of New York's upper class and stunned the world. Come walk with me and strip away the painted surface of the Gilded Age to reveal a tale of sex, madness, and murder. After shooting Stanford White, Harry K. Thaw was seized by the house firemen and rushed towards the exit. They paused briefly when confronted by Evelyn, his 21-year-old wife, who had witnessed the shooting. My God, Harry, she said, I think you've killed him. 
Don't worry, my dear, it will be all right, he replied confidently. I've probably saved your life. Evelyn moved to embrace her husband, but was brushed aside as the fireman thrust him into the elevator. When they reached the street, Thaw was handed over to a policeman and escorted to the 30th Street Police Station to be booked. By morning, Stanford White's murder was front-page news across the country. From the very beginning, it was reported that the motive involved Thaw's wife, who was once the toast of old New York. Born near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on Christmas Day, 1884, Florence Evelyn Nesbitt was the daughter of a struggling lawyer. After his death from spinal meningitis at age 42, he left his family heavily in debt, forcing Evelyn, who was 12, to help support her mother and younger brother. From a tender age, she was known for her beauty and with her mother's consent began modeling for artists. Realizing she could earn more money in New York City, the family relocated. Evelyn caught the eye of artist Charles Dana Gibson, who with pen and ink transformed her profile into the eternal question. While she could earn a decent living modeling for illustrators, she found out that photographers paid double. In front of the camera lens, her face came to represent the Edwardian ideal of feminine beauty, innocence, and charm, not to mention mischief. In October 1901, at age 16, Evelyn was on the Broadway stage as a chorus girl in the hugely popular musical comedy Floridora. It was there that she came to the attention of Stanford White, setting into motion a sequence of events that led directly to the fateful night on the roof of Madison Square Garden. Twelve hours had passed since the shooting, and Harry K. Thaw was moved to the city prison called the Tombs and placed in a cell on Murderer's Row. With a grand jury indictment being an absolute certainty, Thaw was facing the electric chair, as his legal team came together, they realized that the best defense available to them was a plea of insanity. However, Thaw's lawyers were faced with one problem, their client. He said that when he murdered Stanford White, he'd been upholding an unwritten law to defend his family's honor. When word began to circulate that he would plead insanity, Thaw announced publicly that he was not crazy and expressed confidence that he would be acquitted. However, his original attorneys had serious doubts, and over their clients' objections, they made several requests to assemble a lunacy commission to determine if he was fit to stand trial. Furious over their betrayal, Thaw fired them and engaged as his new defense counsel the law firm of Hartridge and Peabody. Once they took over, they leaked stories of how Evelyn was one of many victims of Stanford White, who was a predatory deviant who used money and prestige to ruin underage girls. A cartoonist working for Hearst Newspapers depicted the architect with cloven feet and in the same pose as the statue of Diana standing atop Madison Square Garden's tower, the location of his many crimes. They built their case around the so-called unwritten law and suggested that their client was not a murderer but an avenging angel who brought justice to a wicked man. They would also hedge their plea by calling witnesses to testify about their client's emotional state at the time of the murder. For this to work, they would need Evelyn to reveal under oath intensely private details about what Stanford White had done to her when she was only 16. The lawyers and the Thaw family explained to her that she was all that stood between Harry and the electric chair. When Thaw's trial began on January 23, 1907, he had been languishing in his tomb's jail cell for six months. For the young millionaire, incarceration was unbearable, even though he was afforded special privileges like a brass bed and three meals a day delivered from New York's finest restaurants. The New York City prison was connected to the criminal courts building by a covered bridge called the Bridge of Sighs. It was through this passage that the heir to one of America's great fortunes would travel to go on trial for his life. Thaw welcomed his first day in court, somewhat less confident that the trial would go his way. 
and he had good reason to be nervous as the defense got off to a shaky start. Their very first witness, a self-proclaimed expert in mental illness, was virtually laughed off the stand after being cross-examined by District Attorney Jerome because he seemed oblivious to the most basic elements of his supposed field. That, plus further missteps, prompted an immediate change in his defense counsel, putting the veteran attorney from California, Delphin Delmas, in charge. He called witnesses who testified that Stanford White had sought to destroy Thaw's reputation through scandal and had on more than one occasion threatened to kill him. Each instance pulled out another thread from an already tattered mental state, and all of it led back to one person. When Evelyn Nesbitt Thaw took the stand on February 7th, it was the moment the world had been waiting for. For months it had been teased that her testimony would be explosive, and in anticipation, thousands of people gathered on the streets outside the courthouse, clamoring for a glimpse of the former chorus girl. Inside, the scene was just as chaotic. Reporters, along with members of the public, vied for the few available seats in the courtroom. Everyone else crowded near the court's telegraph station where news of the trial was wired across the country. Complete transcripts of Evelyn's testimony appeared in the morning editions of newspapers, laying bare a tale so depraved that it shook the very foundation of American morality. When Evelyn took the stand, journalist Irvin S. Cobb made the following observations. She came white and cold and outwardly calm in her little plain blue frock, her white turned down collar, her big schoolboy tie, and her black velvet hat. She slipped into the big oak chair like a tired child, her hands dropped into her lap. There was something pitiably small and weak about the girl sitting there, ready to crucify herself for the sake of her husband. What follows comes from her testimony. Evelyn Nesbitt had never heard of Stanford White before she was introduced to him by friend and Floridora castmate Edna Goodrich. She was told that the great architect admired her photographs in the newspapers and magazines and wanted to meet her. Evelyn and Edna arrived at a nondescript brownstone on 24th Street less than a block from the fabulous Madison Square Garden that their host had designed. Upon their introduction, Stanford White gazed at Evelyn, marveling at her features and youthful slender body. Even at age 16, she was used to men gawking over her beauty, but she, on the other hand, was not impressed with her host. He was overweight and seemed older than his 47 years. In her testimony, she referred to him as ugly, Stanford White might have been one of America's leading architects, but Evelyn found him withdrawn and a bit boring. After they lunched, White seemed more at ease and offered to show his female guests around his house. He took them to his studio that encompassed the entire second floor. Evelyn noticed immediately the red velvet covered swing hanging in the middle of the room. White invited her to sit in it and play a little game. He would push her in the swing and she would try to kick a paper umbrella suspended from the ceiling. Soon, Evelyn, Edna, and Stanford White were laughing and enjoying themselves immensely. The informal luncheon ended around 4 p.m. as White returned to work at his office and the girls readied themselves for that evening's performance of Floridora. Evelyn left the meeting thinking nothing more would come from it, but from that moment on, neither her life nor his would ever be the same. Evelyn had nearly forgotten about Stanford White when a second invitation came for lunch and to ride on the red velvet swing, which she gladly accepted. Soon after, he unexpectedly requested a meeting with Evelyn's mother, Florence. He told her that he had many theatrical connections and wished to help her daughter along in her stage career. Florence Nesbitt was awestruck by White and was convinced that his intentions toward her daughter were completely altruistic. After accepting his offer, things changed rapidly. 
He moved Evelyn, her mother, and her brother Howard out of their cramped boarding house and set them up in a hotel suite on Broadway. White also enrolled Howard at an exclusive military school and covered the tuition. He arranged for Evelyn to see a dentist with all charges paid in advance. Later, when Florence Nesbitt mentioned she had an opportunity to visit family in Pittsburgh but lacked the funds to travel, Stanford White cheerfully bought her a train ticket. To put her mind at ease, he also offered to stand in as Evelyn's guardian while she remained in New York to keep her theater engagements. With her mother gone, she spent most of her free time with White, whom she now referred to as Stanny. In the fall of 1901, he introduced her to his friend and well-known photographer, Rudolf Eichmeyer. White was present when Eichmeyer took a series of photographs of the teenage Evelyn, wrapped in a kimono, and posed suggestively on a polar bear rug. Wherever Stanny and Evelyn went, there were always others present. Therefore, she thought nothing of it when the architect invited her to dine with friends one evening at the house on 24th Street. Only when she arrived, he told her that their guests had all abandoned them. Disappointed, she asked if she should go home. He said that that might be appropriate, but since dinner was ready, there was no reason for it to go to waste, and she agreed. He offered her champagne, which at first she was reluctant to accept, but he assured her that it was all right. With dinner over, White asked if she would like to tour other parts of the house that were normally off-limits to guests. Evelyn had complete trust in Stanny and accepted his offer without the least discomfort. They climbed to the third floor and he brought her to his bedroom. She'd never seen anything like it before. The walls and ceiling were covered in mirrors, and in the center of the room stood a large four-poster bed. As she marveled at the sight, White offered her another glass of champagne. Already feeling tipsy, she took it anyway, only this time she noticed that it had a bitter taste. As White described the room's furnishings, Evelyn began to feel lightheaded. His voice grew more and more distant, and she fell into darkness. When she awoke, she was greeted by the disorienting vision of her body floating above her. Gradually, her senses returned, and she realized she was in bed, and the vision was her own reflection in the mirrored ceiling. Then she realized she was completely naked, and that Stanny, also naked, was lying beside her. That was when she started to scream. There were muted gasps and sobs throughout the courtroom as she recounted her story. Harry Thaw squirmed uncomfortably in his chair and was sweating profusely as he listened. Finally, overcome with emotion, he covered his face and began weeping. A reporter wrote that throughout her testimony, Evelyn's expression was strained and agonized, and she repeatedly clasped and unclasped her hands. Defense attorney Delphin Delmas told Evelyn that he appreciated how difficult it was to relive these terrible events, but that it was absolutely essential she go on. After taking a moment to collect herself, Evelyn nodded, and the testimony continued. She said her screams awoke Stanford White, who got up and wrapped her in a kimono. Evelyn noticed splotches of blood on the bedsheets and became more hysterical. White told her to keep quiet, that it was all over and that nothing terrible had happened. You must not worry, my dear, he said in a calming tone. You belong to me now. She hurriedly got dressed as White summoned a cab. He accompanied her back to her hotel room and once alone, he knelt down beside her, tenderly kissing the hem of her dress. He begged her for the opportunity to explain what happened. Evelyn sat beside the window, gazing out at the awakening city. Noticing that she kept her face turned away, White asked, Why don't you look at me, child? She replied, Because I can't. He reiterated that she need not worry about what occurred between them and that everything would be all right. He told her how beautiful she was and said he was going to do wonderful things for her. 
Noticing she was unmoved, he returned to the subject and said everybody did those things. Did them all the time. It was, he said, all that people lived for. White confessed that she was so nice and young and slim that he couldn't control himself and it just happened. He added that only very young girls were nice, and the thinner they were, the prettier they were. Then he added almost jokingly that nothing was so loathsome as fat and that she must never get fat. Finally, Evelyn looked at him and asked if everyone he knew did those things. He assured her that they did. Then she asked him if the Floridora Sextet did them as well. Her query caused him to laugh heartily, and he answered that indeed they all did. Sensing that a weight had been lifted from her, White told Evelyn that one of the great pleasures from doing these things was derived from keeping it a secret. Nobody, he said, talked about it. He added that she must tell no one what happened, especially her mother. He said that if she breathed a single word of it, it would spread like wildfire and it would spell ruin for both of them. As the testimony continued, Delmas questioned Evelyn on how she became acquainted with her husband. He then took her through the events leading up to Harry's proposal of marriage and to how he found out about her history with Stamford White, a history that would ultimately drive him to commit murder. Following the rape, Evelyn's friendship with the architect continued as it had before, and his financial support of her family continued as well. In November 1902, he paid for Evelyn to attend a preparatory school for girls in Pompton, New Jersey, that was run by Beatrice DeMille, the mother of future film director Cecil B. DeMille. She was sent there in part because she had become romantically involved with a struggling young artist and actor named Jack Barrymore. The arrangement was the ploy of Evelyn's mother and Stanford White, and it paid off because by the new year, Barrymore was out of the picture. Ironically, Evelyn met him at a party in Stanford White's Tower Studio at Madison Square Garden. However, Evelyn did not brood very long over the actor's departure as she enjoyed her time at school. At the end of January 1903, she fell ill with a sudden onset of acute appendicitis requiring immediate surgery. Stanford White sent his personal physician to New Jersey to take care of her. When she was well enough to travel, he had her brought to a sanitarium in New York. Much of her recuperation was spent entertaining friends from her theater days. Evelyn's most frequent caller was Harry Thaw, the 31-year-old son of the late Pittsburgh millionaire William Thaw. The family's vast wealth was controlled by its matriarch Mary. They owned palatial homes from Pittsburgh to Newport and had ties to English aristocracy through Harry's sister Alice, who was the wife of George Seymour, the Earl of Yarmouth. Harry had been an obstinate youth who showed very little interest in anything but leisurely pursuits. He was kicked out of virtually every school he attended, including Harvard. When he met Evelyn, Harry was living on an annual salary of $80,000 from the family trust, which he spent with abandon. He had been hanging around the New York theater scene for about a year and knew Evelyn socially. Their friendship blossomed during her recovery when he lavished her with gifts and attention excessively so. In February, he surprised her with an offer to travel with him to Europe. He convinced her that an extended trip abroad would give her the rest she needed to get back to the stage. Evelyn said she would go on the condition that her mother accompany them as her chaperone. Thaw agreed, but Florence was hesitant. She had recently become engaged to marry a stockbroker and did not wish to be away for an extended length of time and there was the fact that she knew nothing about Harry Thaw. Unsure of what to do, Florence turned to Stanford White for advice. At the mention of Thaw's name, a hardness came over the architect's face as if the two men had a history. Indeed, White acknowledged that he did know Thaw, and he warned Florence that he had a checkered reputation as a wastrel and a playboy. Even worse, he added that there were whispers he abused drugs, solicited prostitutes, was cruel and prone to violence. Florence told all of this to Evelyn, but she was unconcerned. 
Harry had always been warm and caring to her, and she refused to believe he could be anything else. Furthermore, she was determined to go to Europe one way or another. She had, in effect, forced her mother's hand, leaving her no choice but to go with them. Evelyn and her mother arrived in Paris at the end of May 1903 where they joined Harry Thaw, who had sailed a few weeks ahead of them. The young millionaire was a gracious and attentive host. Living up to his profligate reputation, he spared no expense in treating his guests to all that the French capital had to offer. On weekends, they took long carriage rides in the country or attended the horse races. Thaw gave lavish dinner parties where he introduced Evelyn to everyone from bohemian artists to European nobility. For a poor girl from Pittsburgh, it was the experience of a lifetime and she drank it all in. But for her mother, the trip was like a jail sentence. Florence rarely accompanied them on their excursions and only saw her daughter when she returned to their apartments late in the evening. The time alone with Evelyn allowed Harry to grow closer to her. Although she immensely enjoyed his company, she did not anticipate what was coming next. During an evening together, Harry dropped to his knee and asked Evelyn to be his wife. Stunned and unsure if he was joking, she laughed nervously and said she couldn't marry him. Initially, Thaw was taken aback. It had only been a couple of years since he was jilted by famed dancer Isadora Duncan. The incident was widely reported and humiliating to the young millionaire, who was not accustomed to being refused. Thaw pressed her for a reason why she could not marry him. She gave awkward excuses about how she was too young to settle down and that his mother would never approve of him bringing a showgirl into the family. He dismissed them all, telling Evelyn not to worry about his mother and that in time she would learn to love her as a daughter. He was convinced that there had to be a greater reason. He had heard talk in New York that Evelyn belonged to Stanford White, and he pointedly asked her if that was the reason. Almost immediately, she began to weep. Thaw asked if the architect had done something to her. She nodded, wiping her tears away. Tell me, Harry implored. Tell me what he did to you, and leave nothing out. And Evelyn did just that, hesitantly at first but she told him about the red velvet swing and White's patronage of her family. She opened up about the dinner for two at his 24th Street brownstone, the champagne, and losing consciousness. She choked back tears recalling how she woke up naked beside White and the blood. When her story concluded, Evelyn was exhausted but curiously at peace. She felt free of the enormous weight she'd been carrying around for nearly two years. But as Harry Thaw listened, he grew more and more agitated. He bit his fingernails, and at one point he covered his face and sobbed. With her tale told, he sprung to his feet and began pacing the room. The filthy beast, he raged. A sixteen-year-old girl. Damn him. He wanted to know what part her mother played in what happened. Evelyn said that her mother didn't know because Stanny had said to keep it a secret. Thaw went on cursing the architect, but finally composed himself enough to take his seat in front of Evelyn. He fixed his eyes on hers. She recalled how his pupils were dilated so that they looked entirely black. Without breaking his gaze, he took her hand and said, Tell me again what he did to you. Tell me everything. In October 1903, Evelyn sailed home alone while Harry remained in Europe on business. Her mother, who had grown weary of Mr. Thaw's European escapades, returned to America two months earlier. Before they parted, Harry told Evelyn that he understood why she had declined his proposal, but he wanted her to know that she was entirely blameless for what Stanford White had done. The fault, he said, lies with the architect and her mother for accepting his generosity. 
Back in New York, Evelyn was on her own for the first time and planned to return to the stage. One day as she was on her way to the theater, a horse-drawn cab pulled up beside her. A familiar man's voice called out. Evelyn turned and smiled warmly. Hello, Stanny, she said. In March 1904, Harry renewed his marriage proposal, and this time Evelyn accepted. The news caused a rift in the Thaw family, and it only added to their embarrassment when a nationally syndicated news story appeared that included a photo spread of Evelyn under the headline, The Face That Won $5 Million. Hinting at scandal, the article described Evelyn as the muse of many great artists who, quote, fell victim to her beauty. The story only mentioned one of those artists by name. This is perhaps the first time the names Stanford White and Evelyn Nesbitt appear in print together, a full two years before they would forever be linked in infamy. On the 4th of April, 1905, Evelyn Florence Nesbitt became the wife of Harry Kendall Thaw. The wedding was decidedly not in the Harry Thaw tradition. It was arranged by his mother who insisted on a private, almost secret affair. The only witnesses were Evelyn's mother and stepfather, and on the groom's side it was his mother and younger brother. Harry's three other siblings did not approve of Evelyn and refused to attend. None of the couple's friends or acquaintances were invited. After a month-long honeymoon, the Thaws moved into the family's Lindhurst estate in Pittsburgh, where, like a Grimm's fairy tale, Evelyn found herself under the constant gaze of a mother-in-law who detested her. Adding to her misery was the fact that Harry was usually away on business. Most of his business was the pursuit of Stanford White, whom he began to refer to as the Beast. Since hearing Evelyn's story, he had become obsessed with having the architect prosecuted for what he did. Using his family's wealth, he hired the Pinkerton Detective Agency to follow White. He was certain that what he had done to his wife was not an isolated incident. After learning that Evelyn received several personal letters from the architect, Thaw became convinced that he was trying to renew his relationship with his wife. He became increasingly paranoid that the Beast was planning to permanently take him out of the picture. Then sometime in late 1905, Harry purchased a 38 caliber revolver. Thirteen months hidden away in the Thaw mansion left Evelyn feeling isolated and forgotten and contemplating divorce. Sensing her frustration, Harry gave Evelyn an anniversary surprise of a summer holiday abroad. She was thrilled that her long confinement was at an end when in late June 1906, they traveled by train to New York where they would embark for Europe. The night before they were to sail, Harry and Evelyn dined with two friends at the Cafe Martin, a popular spot among Manhattan's social set. One of their guests was Truxton Beale, a former diplomat and philanthropist. He was notorious for having been involved in the shooting of a newspaper publisher who printed a slanderous story about his fiancée. Thaw was fascinated by Beale's account of the incident, especially about how a jury deemed the shooting was justified and acquitted him of attempted murder. Finding the conversation boring, Evelyn picked at her dinner. For most of the evening she had acted detached, almost aloof, until she took notice of a new patron entering the restaurant. Shrinking into her seat, she hastily scribbled a note and handed it to her husband. Harry read it, and following Evelyn's gaze, saw Stanford White take a seat at a table across the room. Thaw's party had tickets for that evening's premiere of Mamselle Champagne at the rooftop theater in Madison Square Garden. He suggested to his guests that they should go now if they didn't want to miss the start of the performance. Thaw's blood boiled when, as they left, he observed White and his guests burst into laughter. He knew that he was the butt of some filthy joke. Feeling the weight of the revolver in his pocket, Thaw wondered how amused they would all be if he decided to use it right then. The walk to Madison Square Garden did little to lighten Thaw's mood. Its obscene tower loomed over them like a distorted phallus. 
It was clear that Stanford White built his personal pleasure dome that way on purpose. Thaw once tried to rent an apartment there so he could keep a watch over him, but of course he was denied. Like everything else he wanted in New York, the beast was always there to ruin it, just as he had ruined his wife. Despite its promise of being the next Floridora, the musical Mamselle Champagne was nothing more than a dreary potboiler. Harry excused himself from his party several times to greet friends who were in the audience. While he was up, he noticed Stanford White was also attending the show, and he seemed to be paying particular attention to the young chorus girls on stage. No doubt he had intentions of luring one of them up to his tower lair. To Harry, it was no mere coincidence that the Beast had presented himself twice that evening. He would say later that Providence brought them together, and it was clear to him what he was meant to do. By the time he returned to his table, he sensed that Evelyn wanted to leave. Harry graciously invited his guests to continue their party elsewhere. Harry followed Evelyn and their friends towards the exit which was why they didn't notice until they reached the elevator that he wasn't with them. Evelyn looked back and saw her husband standing in the audience with his arm raised. Then she saw the pistol aimed at Stanford White. Before she could say anything, the gun went off. The first bullet tore a hole in White's shoulder. In shock, the architect rose from his seat. Harry stepped within three feet of his target, then pulled the trigger again. The bullet smashed into White's skull just below his left eye. He fell back into the chair, his face blackened by gunpowder. Incredibly, Thaw detected life in the man who had raped his wife. He fired again. The third bullet struck him in the mouth, shattering his teeth before entering his brain. Thaw watched as White fell to the floor. Blood started to pool around his head. At last, the beast was destroyed. Never again would he hurt anyone. Evelyn's story of betrayal and rape played out over two grueling days on the stand. Newspapers ran extra editions with full transcripts of her testimony that sold out as soon as they hit the street. Never before had the taboo subject of sex been so openly discussed, and the public thirstily absorbed each salacious word. Concerned that a moral crisis was at hand, religious leaders voiced outrage at publishers and demanded that they be held accountable for what they printed. They believed that the widespread discussion of abhorrent sex would lead to the mortal sin of fornication, thereby putting the transgressor's soul in danger of eternal damnation. The outcry was so great that President Theodore Roosevelt sought to have publications carrying details of the trial banned from the mail service. Although the hero of San Juan and a former acquaintance of Stanford White admitted to personally having read what he called the disgusting particulars of Evelyn's testimony. Despite the controversy, the public did not fault Evelyn for it. They felt she had suffered enough while in the clutches of Stanford White, and they admired her for bearing her shame so bravely for love's sake. But what she had endured as a witness for the defense would be nothing compared to what was to come under cross-examination. District Attorney William Travers Jerome was ready to show the jury and the world a different side of the defendant and his chorus girl wife. When Jerome took on the Stanford White murder case, he found it laughable that Harry K. Thaw's defense counsel intended to save their client with the so-called unwritten law. In his mind, it was essentially legal malpractice, but if that's how they intended to proceed, he vowed to tear their case to pieces. He knew that the defense was hanging all of its hopes on Evelyn, and with the sympathy she was getting in the press, it seemed that they had achieved their goal. But Jerome had seen fakers so many times that he could spot them a mile away, and Evelyn didn't fool him for a minute. Her story was too polished, too practiced, and an obvious attempt to get at the jurors' heartstrings. Jerome knew that there was another side to Evelyn, 
The prosecutor believed that she was a skillful manipulator of men, and he was determined to show the jury who she really was. And on February 19th, Evelyn Nesbitt Thaw was called back to the stand. He began by questioning her about her friendship with James Garland, a married 30-year-old businessman whom she met when she was 15. When Jerome suggested that she had caused the breakup of his marriage, Evelyn said that nothing improper ever occurred between them. The DA then moved on to her relationship with actor John Barrymore. He specifically wanted to know if she ever spent the night with him. When she denied this, Jerome went on to suggest that not only had they spent the night together, but that it resulted in a pregnancy. He speculated that this was the true reason she was sent away to school in New Jersey, and he implied that the operation she had to remove her appendix was in reality an illegal abortion. He then turned to Evelyn's association with Stanford White by asking her to identify a series of canceled checks written by the architect and made out to her. He stated for the record that all the checks were dated from late 1901 through early 1903, after the alleged rape. He wanted to know if she continued having intimate relations with the architect after he assaulted her. Evelyn confessed that she did, but not willingly. He then inquired if her mother knew what was going on between them. Evelyn said she didn't, and that she would have preferred to die rather than tell her. Jerome then asked if she loved Stanford White. She answered on the contrary. She hated him. The prosecutor inquired why then would she accept friendship and money from a man who had wronged her so terribly. Evelyn declared that the intimacy was always forced and that she had no knowledge of the financial arrangements as they were handled by her mother. The DA painted Evelyn with the crimson shades of promiscuity, adultery, and abortion. Now he would brand her a liar. In her testimony, she stated that Stanford White raped her the night after they had visited Rudolf Eichmeier's studio where the infamous kimono photographs were taken. Jerome knew by the photographer's appointment books for 1901 that the only entry containing Evelyn's name was on November 4th, meaning that the rape occurred on the night of the 5th. Here the prosecutor laid his trap because on that evening Stanford White was hosting a dinner party at his home in Manhattan and could not have raped her when she claimed. All the DA needed her to do was confirm that November 4th was the date the kimono photos were taken. But Evelyn sensed what Jerome was doing, and she testified that despite what was written in Ike Meyer's appointment book, she could not recall the exact date, but was certain that it was before the month of November. It was a frustrating turn for the DA, but if she couldn't recall the date, then perhaps the photographer could, and Eichmeier was called to the stand. But Delma objected, stating that Evelyn had only testified about conversations she had with her husband and not about photographs. Therefore, the district attorney could not question the witness about what wasn't in evidence. It was Delmas's strategy from the beginning to hinder the DA by having Evelyn only answer questions concerning what she told Harry Thaw about her rape. On that score, the defense's case did not depend on whether Evelyn was telling the truth or not. However, Jerome had another card to play. He couldn't disprove Evelyn's personal conversations, but he could raise doubts that they happened the way she described. To do that, Jerome called on an unlikely ally in attorney Abe Hummel. Hummel testified that in late 1903, Stanford White brought Evelyn to his office. There, she told him that while she was with Harry Thaw in Europe, he had brutally whipped her when she refused to make false allegations of rape against the architect. Hummel said he prepared an affidavit to that effect, which she signed. A photographic copy of the affidavit bearing Evelyn's signature was entered into evidence. Jerome then called Evelyn back to the stand. She said the signature appeared to be hers, but she denied making any such statement to Hummel nor had she ever seen the affidavit, let alone affixed her signature to it. Delmas argued that a photograph of a document could not be verified as genuine, and since no original existed for them to examine, it had to be assumed that it was a forgery. He added that it certainly was not above Mr. Hummel to manufacture evidence. He told the jury that Jerome once prosecuted the attorney for bribing a witness in a divorce case. Delmas went on, saying that the DA currently had Hummel under a felony indictment for subornation of perjury. 
It was likely, he said, that the only true statement made by the witness in this case was his name. Jerome's strategy had backfired terribly, as the defense effectively discredited the witness that was supposed to discredit Evelyn. It seemed that the DA was parried at every turn. However, the defense's case had one weakness. Jerome's impeachment of Evelyn did not go as planned. She had been far stronger than he imagined. Plus, he lost a potential witness who could have plausibly damaged her credibility. It was supposed that Howard Nesbitt, Evelyn's brother, would testify that she told him that Thaw had beaten her, and that later she offered him money to purchase a revolver for her husband. But at the last minute, Howard refused to contradict his sister. Jerome had reservations about calling Evelyn to the stand from the very beginning. He stated earnestly that he had no desire to put her through the rigors of cross-examination. He said he would gladly spare her further shame if the defense agreed to change their plea to not guilty by reason of insanity. However, the defense stubbornly held that their client was sane while simultaneously suggesting he wasn't. Time and again, they called expert witnesses to testify about Thaw's impaired mental state. They produced Harry's will, which contained a codicil with instructions in case he should die under suspicious circumstances. They said it proved he suffered from paranoia. They questioned Harry's mother, who testified that her son was not the same after returning home from Europe with Evelyn in 1903. She said he was unable to sleep, had lost interest in old hobbies, and when she asked what vexed him so, he told her that he couldn't talk about it. Delmas contended that after Thaw heard Evelyn's story of betrayal, a murderous rage built up inside of him and erupted on the night he encountered Stanford White on the rooftop of Madison Square Garden. One alienist described it as a sudden brainstorm. Whenever the subject of Thaw's sanity was raised, Jerome objected on the grounds that if he was mentally ill, then the trial must be stopped and the defendant be examined by a lunacy commission. Finally, on March 26th, Justice Fitzgerald dismissed the jury and appointed a three-man panel to determine whether Harry K. Thaw understood the magnitude of his crime. For five days, they interviewed key witnesses, including the defendant. On April 4th, they declared that he knew killing Stanford White was wrong. Four days later, both sides rested. In his closing argument, Attorney Delmas aligned the mental condition that drove his client to commit murder with the concept of American values and he gave it a name. Gentlemen, if you desire a name for this species of insanity, let me suggest it. Call it Dementia Americana. It is a species of insanity which makes every American man believe his home to be sacred. That is the species of insanity which makes him believe the honor of his daughter is sacred. That is the species of insanity which makes him believe the honor of his wife is sacred. That is the species of insanity which makes him believe that whosoever invades his home, that whosoever stains the virtue of this threshold has violated the highest of human laws and must appeal to the mercy of God, if mercy there be for him anywhere in the universe. Jerome spoke next. He scoffed at the concept of dementia Americana being relevant in this case adding that the condition doesn't for two years flaunt an unfortunate girl around as a mistress. He exhibited early photos of Evelyn and asked the jury if they looked anything like the girl who sat before them in court, or if they looked more like a wise young actress who lay like a tigress between two men, egging them on with tales that she'd been wronged by the other. The DA said the case was not one of St. George rescuing a maiden, but rather a common, sordid, vulgar, everyday tenderloin murder. Then he asked the jury if they would acquit a cold-blooded, deliberate, cowardly killer because his wife had a pretty face. On April 10, 1907, the fate of Harry Kendall Thaw was at last put in the hands of the jury. As the jury began deliberations, a new moving picture was making the rounds at Nickelodeon's and burlesque theaters across the country. 
called The Unwritten Law, it was rushed into production while the trial was ongoing. Based entirely on Evelyn's testimony, it traced her life from her days as an artist's model up to the trial and on to her husband's supposed heroic vindication. The film's climax was exactly what Harry K. Thaw and many observers assumed would happen. In Thaw's mind, the fact that the jury needed to retire before rendering an acquittal was a mere formality. But in truth, the decision would not come easy. The jurors debated late into the first night and could not reach an agreement. After three separate polls, the count stood at eight to four in favor of conviction. On the morning of the second day, a buzz circulated around the courthouse that the jury was assembling in the courtroom. A crowd of thousands gathered in front of the criminal courts building in anticipation of a verdict. But the jury had requested readings of the testimonies of witnesses to the shooting. Another day would pass without a decision. Thaw spent a restless night pacing nervously in his tomb's jail cell while Evelyn and his mother tried in vain to reassure him. Then on the third day an announcement was made that all parties had been called to Justice Fitzgerald's courtroom at 4 p.m. The moment the world was waiting for had finally arrived. It was observed that when Thaw rose to face the jury he needed to support himself by holding on to the table. The judge then asked the foreman if the jury had reached a consensus. The answer was regrettably that they had not. The twelve men were hopelessly deadlocked. Thaw slumped into his chair as he realized the nightmare was far from over. The final tally was seven to five in favor of conviction. The jury had split over the question of Harry K. Thaw's sanity. When asked what effect Evelyn's explosive testimony had on their decision, the jury's unanimous response was that despite being deeply moving, it wasn't considered at all. When District Attorney Jerome was asked when the retrial would take place, he said his office had a backlog of cases that needed to be tried first. He added with a satisfactory air that Harry Thaw would have to languish in his tomb cell and wait his turn like everyone else. When Harry K. Thaw left his tomb's jail cell and crossed the Bridge of Sighs to the Criminal Courts Building for the last time on February 1st, 1908, it was with a keen sense of deja vu. Nineteen months had passed since he fired three bullets into Stanford White's body, and now for the second time he would await the verdict of twelve strangers. He blamed the fiasco of the first trial on his attorneys, singling out Delphin Delmas, who he believed had botched his defense by showboating and waffling around the issue of his sanity. For the retrial, Thaw hired new counsel, and this time he would claim to have been temporarily insane at the time of the murder. Popular opinion was still very much on Thaw's side, but the first jury sent a clear message that the unwritten law would not save him from the electric chair. Evelyn was called to repeat her testimony just as she had in the first trial, but the defense's star witness was Harry's mother. Mary Thaw came to the stand dressed in mourning black and looking frail beyond her 65 years. She testified that her son had shown signs of insanity his whole life. Marked by sudden mood swings, nervousness and erratic, sometimes violent behavior, she believed her son's condition was congenital from both the maternal and paternal sides of the family. District Attorney Jerome was back as prosecutor, and he ridiculed the insanity defense by noting how vehemently the defendant had rejected it a year earlier. He made it clear to the jury that Thaw was a cold, calculative killer and a coward who used others to shield himself from punishment for his crime. The second trial lasted less than a month, only a quarter of the time spent on the first. Thaw stood with steady resolve as he studied the faces of the jury trying to discern his fate in their expressions. They had needed only 25 hours to find that Harry Kendall Thaw was not guilty by reason of insanity. A smile brightened Thaw's face as he turned to look triumphantly at Evelyn. 
A single spectator in the courtroom broke into applause, prompting Judge Victor Dowling to order his arrest. The offender turned out to be professional tennis player Theodore Pell, who was the nephew of President Roosevelt. He was fined $25 for his outburst. With order restored in his courtroom, Judge Dowling spoke. He declared that based on the evidence, Harry Thaw posed a significant danger to the public and that it was the court's duty to have him committed to the Matawan State Hospital for the criminally insane until he was no longer a threat to society. Thaw was stunned. He believed that his family would be allowed to send him to a private institution of their choice. He raged mercilessly at his attorneys for not objecting to the court's outrageous ruling. They assured him that they would use every legal option available to them, but that he would have to give it time. Much of the public shared Thaw's disbelief over the verdict, but were glad that the case was now closed. One newspaper expressed the city's feelings with an editorial cartoon depicting the Thaw trial as a dark spectral figure being consigned to oblivion by Dietrich Knickerbocker, the fictional symbol of old New York. Before leaving by train for Dutchess County, Harry Thaw released the following statement. I am perfectly sane now, but I am going to Matawan on the advice of my counsel, who will proceed in the matter of my release. I am confident that my stay there will be for a short period of time only. Harry K. Thaw spent five long years at Matawan State Hospital. The millionaire playboy who was used to living in palaces now slept on a cot inside of a crowded dormitory. Instead of hobnobbing with the cream of European society, he rubbed shoulders with rapists, arsonists, and murderers. It was an unbearable ordeal for Harry, who could not understand why the state of New York would keep him locked up after the jury found him not guilty. Between 1908 and 1912, his attorneys filed three separate writs of habeas corpus, demanding the state of New York show cause. But each attempt to win his freedom ended in failure. A fourth writ was filed in 1913, but was withdrawn when news leaked that an intermediary for the Thaw family paid a $25,000 bribe to the hospital administrator to sign off on Harry's release. The move touched off a firestorm that did incalculable harm to his cause and put an immediate end to any legal attempt to free him. It was the last straw for the desperate millionaire who quietly began making his own arrangements. At 7.45 on Sunday morning, August 17, 1913, Thaw was at his work detail in the asylum's laundry room. Just then, as the hospital was receiving its scheduled milk delivery, he slipped unnoticed through a back door, dashed across the exercise yard, and ran through an open gate into a waiting automobile. Before the gatekeeper could sound an alarm, the car sped away in a cloud of dust. Harry K. Thaw had just escaped from the madhouse. Mary Thaw was staying at her family's summer home when word of her son's escape reached her. Thank God, she was said to have exclaimed. Harry's actions were heavy-handed, but the state of New York's persecution of him has been no different. I'm glad he's free. The dowager, whose support of her son never wavered, closed her remarks by saying that neither she nor her family had anything to do with Harry's escape. As the news burned up the wire services, a reporter for the New York Evening World rushed to the Hammerstein Theater where Evelyn Nesbitt was rehearsing a new vaudeville dance review with partner Jack Clifford. She was recently quoted in the press saying that she was forever done with the name of Thaw, and her return to the stage was a public declaration of independence. Legally, and to the embarrassment of the Thaw family, she was still Harry's wife. It was partly in retribution for the contempt they always had for her, which had grown into hostility after the end of the second trial. With Harry out of the picture, she made a deal whereby she would divorce her husband. But Evelyn dropped the suit after Harry's mother failed to pay the settlement. Since then, Evelyn was virtually cut off from the family fortune. 
The Thaws complained that Evelyn was only interested in money. By 1913, money was certainly in the forefront of her mind as she was then the mother of a three-year-old boy. Evelyn claimed that Russell Thaw was conceived during one of her many private visits to her husband. However, Harry emphatically denied he was the father. Privately, his opinion was more indelicate. Mrs. Thaw isn't the first chorus girl to try to give a bastard a good name. When the reporter caught up with her at the theater, Evelyn hadn't yet heard about Harry's escape. Completely caught off guard, her face grew pale, and she recoiled as if she had been physically struck. He's going to kill me. He told me he would, just like I told them at the trial. Evelyn was referring to the testimony she gave at Harry's sanity hearings. At both of his murder trials, she had exposed her deepest, most intimate secrets in order to save him from the electric chair. But during the fight to win his freedom, her secrets could only harm him. As the question of whether or not Harry Thaw posed a danger to the public was debated in court, Evelyn was called to testify about an alleged threat her husband made after he was committed. Initially, she refused to answer, fearing she would have to bear the consequences of blocking his release. Finally, after being warned she was facing contempt, Evelyn grudgingly admitted that Harry told her as soon as he was free, he would have to kill her too. It was the final nail that kept Harry a ward of the Matawan State Hospital for half a decade. But now that the madman was on the loose, there was no telling where he would turn up or what he would do when he got there. The New York City police placed guards around the panic-stricken Evelyn, but in actuality she had no cause for alarm. Harry had no intention of tracking her down to satisfy a raging bloodlust. His plan was to get beyond the reach of New York State authorities as quickly as possible, and for two days he managed to stay off the radar. There were rumors he had chartered a yacht to England, then on the day following his escape he sent a note to his mother telling her that he was coming to her summer home in Pennsylvania. But none of the leads panned out. Finally, news broke that he had been arrested in Canada just across the border from New Hampshire. He was held for violating Canada's immigration law, which denied admittance to anyone who'd been ruled insane within the last five years. In the meantime, a delegation from New York arrived on scene ready to recapture the bothersome millionaire as soon as immigration officials finalized his deportation. The delegation was headed by Thaw's old nemesis, William Travers Jerome. In an odd twist, Jerome found himself briefly under arrest for gambling. However, all the charges against him were dropped when it was revealed he was playing a penny ante game of poker. On September 10th, the Minister of Justice ordered Thaw's immediate deportation to the United States. But it didn't turn out the way Jerome had wished. Thaw was removed from Canada by federal officers who deposited him on a deserted road in Vermont. He was picked up by a correspondent from the Associated Press and brought to New Hampshire where he was taken into police custody. This opened up another fight over extradition. Thaw's lawyers had contested that no legal grounds existed to send him back to New York because he had not broken any laws, nor was he under criminal indictment. However, New York contended that he had entered into a conspiracy with at least five others to achieve his flight from the Matawan Asylum. Public opinion was solidly on Thaw's side as the battle for extradition lasted for more than a year. It eventually made its way to the United States Supreme Court where it was unanimously decided that the millionaire must return to New York and answer the conspiracy charges. The decision was seen as a triumph of justice over money, but even though he had lost the battle, the war waged on for nearly two years. Eventually, Thaw was acquitted of conspiracy and granted a new sanity hearing. However, this time a jury would be allowed to decide the outcome. And on July 14, 1915, the jury declared him sane, and within a few days he was a free man. It was a legal victory that wasn't without controversy, and as Harry Kendall Thaw marched triumphantly out of the courthouse, many wondered how long it would last.
Here at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California, rests the body of a minor but nonetheless important player in this tale of sex, madness, and murder. His grave is located on the east-facing slope of what is called the Everlasting Love section. Frederick Gump is key because the terrifying crime committed upon him would forever dispel any doubt that Harry Thaw was a madman. From the moment Thaw walked free, the question on everyone's mind was what he planned to do next. As he traveled home to Pennsylvania, he made an overnight stop in Atlantic City where he got his first taste of freedom in nine years. He took in the sights along the boardwalk, bathed in the ocean, and dined on watermelon and mineral water. Thaw even attended church the next morning. When he reached his mother's home in Pittsburgh, he told the press that he was forever through with New York and white lights. He added that he would never again drink liquor, but most emphatically he declared he was done with Evelyn and that he would file for divorce as soon as possible. Evelyn was on the vaudeville circuit when she heard the news. Trying to seem unmoved, she gave the following statement to the press. I don't care. I don't want Thaw's name and I don't want his money. He is evidently still a cad, besides being America's pet murderer. All I want from him is to be left in peace to continue my stage career. But you know what I find so mysterious in this mysterious universe? It's that a human being who calls himself a man can so quickly forget the sacrifice I made for him and to nonchalantly remark that he has no interest in the woman who saved his life? As for Harry Thaw, <laughs> you watch. A fox may change its fur, but its habits, never. Fred Gump was 19 years old when he stepped off the train in New York City on Christmas Day, 1916, which coincidentally was Evelyn's 32nd birthday. Born and raised in Kansas City, this was his first time in America's grandest metropolis. He came as the guest of Harry Thaw, whom he had met about a year earlier in Long Beach, California. The famous millionaire had taken an interest in the young man and offered to pay for his education at an engineering school in Pittsburgh. With his parents' consent, Fred Gump leapt at the opportunity. They had no reservations about trusting their son to the care of a murderer. The Gumps, like most people, still believed Thaw had acted morally in avenging the rape of his wife. Upon his arrival in New York, Thaw treated the teenager to dinner and a show before bringing him back to his rooms at the fashionable Hotel McAlpin in Herald Square. Once upstairs, Fred's host invited him to take a bath before going to bed, which after a long day of travel and sightseeing, he gladly accepted. It was the perfect end to a perfect day, but Fred Gump would soon find out that the night was just getting started. When he stepped out of the tub, he realized there were no towels to dry himself off. And almost on cue, the bathroom door swung open, and there stood Harry Thaw wearing only a robe. He offered Fred a towel, but as he reached to take it, Thaw let it fall to the floor and he grabbed his wrist. In his other hand, he held a leather whip. With his eyes fixed and dilated, he asked, Are you ready to become my slave? The next afternoon, a pale and trembling Fred Gump hurried unnoticed through the lobby of the Hotel McAlpin and onto Broadway. He caught a trolley to the train station where he bought a ticket back to Kansas City. Days later, he was safely back home and the details of what Thaw had done to him emerged. Gump said the deranged millionaire savagely beat his naked body with whips. His cries for help went unanswered. He tried to fight back, but Thaw was able to overpower him. At one point, he attempted to escape through a window, but Thaw pulled him back into the room. Between blows, Thaw hovered over him, demanding that he become his slave for four years. Exhausted and terrified, Gump agreed and the beating stopped, temporarily. Thaw then instructed the boy to kiss his feet, and his hands, and then his mouth. 
Finally, he made him lie down in bed with him. Fred waited for his tormentor to fall asleep before attempting to leave the room, but the door was locked. It wasn't until the next day that he was able to make his escape. Photographs of Fred Gump's badly welted body were sent to the New York District Attorney. An immediate arrest warrant was issued for Thaw, but he had long since left the city. Once again, the psychotic millionaire was the subject of a nationwide manhunt. This was not the first time the public heard of Harry Thaw's proclivity with the lash. During a habeas corpus hearing in 1909, the state of New York called Mrs. Susan Merrill as a witness. She was owner of a boarding house in Manhattan's Tenderloin District that was frequented by young actresses, and Harry, posing as a theatrical agent, made regular visits. Mrs. Merrill said that some of the girls fled the house complaining that Thaw had attacked them with whips. When confronted, he said it was part of their theatrical training. He compensated Mrs. Merrill for the loss of revenue and paid the girls to keep their silence. But the beatings did not stop until Mrs. Merrill caught him in the act and banned him from the property. She even managed to keep one of his ivory handle dog whips. However, Mrs. Merrill's testimony was discredited by Thaw's attorneys and the press when it was revealed she had made false statements in other cases. On January 9th, the grand jury in New York indicted Thaw for the kidnapping and battery of Fred Gump. With the culprit nowhere in sight, the country had a fresh scandal to distract them from the war in Europe. Two days later, the fugitive millionaire was found in a Philadelphia rooming house lying face down in a bed soaked in his own blood. Despondent and alone, he used a straight razor to slash his arm and wrist and then his throat, but somehow he managed to survive. The news of Harry's suicide attempt was a tremendous blow to his mother, whom the newspapers began referring to as the Woman of Sorrows. Mary Thaw had always been her son's most stalwart defender, but now she could no longer deny that he was a sick man. I am unable to resist the facts that demonstrate my son's insanity. While the truth shocks me, it also plainly points the path of duty. I know, as I never knew before, that my son is an irresponsible man whom the law must protect. From her statement, it was clear that Mary Thaw was concerned about something more than her son's mental well-being. She needed to have him committed to an institution in Pennsylvania to prevent extradition to New York where he faced criminal charges. Ultimately, she got her way and Harry spent the next seven years in a private asylum. Thaw was released in 1924 and returned to New York to answer the old charges against him. In the meantime, his mother settled with Fred Gump for a reported $100,000, although some estimates say it was for only a quarter of that amount. The settlement came with the agreement that Gump wouldn't press charges or testify against Harry, and as a result, New York dropped all charges. The Thaws couldn't have hoped for a better outcome, and it prompted one writer to remark that there is no injustice that the dollar can't surmount. For the first time in 18 years, Harry Thaw was not bound by any legal restraints, and one of the first projects he undertook was to tell his side of what happened on the rooftop of Madison Square Garden all those years ago. The result was a rambling, self-aggrandizing memoir called The Traitor. Published in 1926, he characterized the murder of Stanford White as an act of providence he would gladly repeat. Thaw didn't make clear who he thought the traitor was because he was critical of almost everyone involved in his trials, from the prosecution to his own counsel. However, he took a relatively soft and genial view of Evelyn that seemed to smooth over the rifts of the past. A publicity campaign for the book briefly reunited the star-crossed couple, giving rise to speculation that they were going to give marriage another try. But the rumors were immediately denied. The publicity did little to promote book sales as the pair were seen as old news. Thaw tried to clean up his image by purchasing an estate in Northern Virginia where he joined the Volunteer Fire Brigade and became a gentleman farmer. 
Of course, the New York newspapers couldn't help but snicker. He also considered opening a movie studio in Hollywood where he planned to produce a film about his life. What Evelyn said about a fox changing its habits proved true. When Harry wasn't entertaining young starlets, he routinely made his way back into the headlines and courtrooms over alleged beatings and nightclub brawls. Because of his notorious past, he was barred from entering England in 1928. And what could be said of his romantic life was always fodder for the tabloids. Harry's life was dealt a serious blow on June 9, 1929, when his long-suffering mother died at age 86. Mary Thaw had been his greatest defender, who, if not for her son, would be remembered for her philanthropic work. By the time of her death, she had nearly exhausted her family's fortune trying to keep her son out of prison. She was laid to rest in the family plot in Pittsburgh's Allegheny Cemetery. As the years went on, the man who gave the idle rich a bad name could still be found in the company of beautiful women at swank New York nightclubs. But as he entered his 70s, he traded the Great White Way for Florida's Gold Coast and evenings playing bridge. Gradually, he fell into obscurity, only to pop up now and again as a feature in the Guess Who's Still Alive column. In late 1946, he escaped the harsh Pittsburgh winter to take up residence at a rented estate in Miami Beach. The story goes that shortly after he moved in, a neighbor came by to introduce herself. When she called at the door, a voice from deep within the large waterfront home invited her in. She followed the voice to a bedroom where she was shocked to find an elderly white-haired man jumping on the bed like a small child. When she expressed concern that he might injure himself, the man stopped and looked at her in bewilderment. Don't you know who I am? The infamous millionaire asked. She shook her head. I am Harry Thaw of Pittsburgh. He giggled, then resumed jumping on the bed, repeating his introduction over and over and over. A few months later, Harry Kendall Thaw was dead at age 76. It snowed in western Pennsylvania on the day he was buried near his devoted mother. Fewer than 20 mourners were present, and only one member of the Thaw family, a nephew, was there to send him off. His last surviving sibling was too ill to attend. Neither Evelyn nor the son she claimed was his showed up to pay their respects. Harry left the bulk of his estate to his nephew and smaller sums to friends and chance acquaintances, such as $25 to radio commentator Walter Winchell and $40,000 to the former Miss Philadelphia of 1929, whom he only met once. For Evelyn, he left $10,000. Harry's life was filled with sound and fury that he would say was spent defending himself from an army of relentless attackers. He died having never expressed regret or remorse for murdering Stanford White, the exploitation of his wife, or the torture of Fred Gump. His epitaph is evidence that he only saw himself for the charitable causes he supported, but overlooked the vast fortune he wasted on hedonism. As the last shovel full of earth covered his grave, only one of the principal actors was left standing to tell the tale. In 1955, 20th Century Fox released The Girl on the Red Velvet Swing, starring Joan Collins as Evelyn Nesbitt, Ray Milland as Stanford White, and Farley Granger as Harry K. Thaw. It was the first time a major Hollywood studio told the story of the deadly love triangle. I did it because he ruined my wife. Although Evelyn did not participate in the film's production, she was paid for the rights to tell her story. 
She wasn't eager to do publicity, but as the tragedy's only surviving participant, she agreed to sit down for an interview. A half century had passed, and Evelyn, now 70, was living in a small studio apartment near the Santa Monica Freeway in Los Angeles. The former model and chorus girl no longer desired fancy clothes, cars, or houses, and had transformed her life into one of unadorned simplicity. She happily split her time between her grandchildren and sculpting, which she also taught to others on the side. She had little time to dwell on the past, but she was ready to talk about her life after the trial. She said that living under the thumb of the Thaw family was like being a trophy, trotted out and displayed when needed, and then discarded afterward. Eager to make the break, she hardly waited for the ink to dry on Harry's divorce before marrying her show business dance partner. However, the popularity of vaudeville was in decline, and Evelyn turned to the new medium of motion pictures. She made her first film in 1914, and within three years had signed a five-picture deal with Fox Studios. Many of her films featured her son Russell, whom she called Pom Pom. Evelyn's movie career reached its zenith in 1919 when she was diagnosed with facial neuralgia, an intensely painful nerve disorder. When the prescribed medical treatments failed to help, an actress friend gave her a series of injections. The injections were morphine, which eased her pain, but she would always require more. In a short time, she was addicted to the opioid, which was compounded with the consumption of alcohol. During this time, Evelyn opened a tea room on West 52nd Street, just off Broadway. But the venture was doomed from the outset. Counting on her notoriety to bring in business, it only attracted people who came to gawk and not to drink tea and eat cakes. Employees stole from her and old show business cronies took advantage of her kind-hearted nature. As losses and debts mounted, Evelyn was forced to close and what hadn't been stolen was seized by creditors. To support herself and Pom Pom, Evelyn moved to Atlantic City where she was a popular draw in the cabarets and nightclubs along the boardwalk. She also spent months touring the country where despite her hard work, she had little to show for it. She often fell victim to shady operators who didn't pay what they promised or didn't pay at all. Evelyn always sought her independence, but she could never escape the hold that Harry Thaw had on her. If there was anything she wanted from him, it was only an acknowledgement that he was Russell's father, but Harry made it clear that it was something he would never give. In the divorce filing, he alleged that the boy was the result of an adulterous affair. But Evelyn denied the allegation, saying that Russell was conceived at a rendezvous with Harry during one of his secret furloughs from Matawan State Hospital. However, if she wanted Russell to have any legal standing as Thaw's heir, she needed to prove his paternity, something she never pursued. Her reasoning was that she didn't have a prayer of going against the family's vast wealth. Russell was 16 when he finally met the man supposed to be his father. At the meeting, he showed Thaw all the courtesy that good manners required, but privately he coolly sized him up, looking for traces of himself within his madman's stare. Finding none, he forever turned his back on his namesake. What Harry Thaw thought of Russell is unknown, as he never spoke of him publicly. As Evelyn neared her forties, her movie career was over. Producers at Fox refused to extend her contract citing that age and drug abuse had diminished her sex appeal. At this point in her life, she was rarely sober, and in January 1926, after a night of drinking, Evelyn returned to her Chicago hotel room and in a fit of despair drank a bottle of disinfectant. Russell, who was asleep in the other room, heard her screams and called for help. Later, he told police that this was his mother's third attempt to kill herself. In a written statement, Harry Thaw expressed his wishes for his ex-wife's speedy recovery. He also wanted it known that he was providing her a $10 a day income, the last monthly payment of which was in the mail. It was a close call, but Evelyn survived her suicide attempt. After months of recuperation, she emerged with a new outlook. She was determined to beat drug addiction 
and it turned out to be her greatest triumph, one that left her more grounded and spiritual. During her recovery, she studied the philosophies of Hinduism and Buddhism and believed that past karma was the cause of her problems. She realized that her relationship with Stanford White, her marriage to Harry Thaw, the murder, the trials, and the part she played in all of it had not been reconciled and had been eating away at her like a cancer. She was convinced that to move on, she would have to come to terms with the past. In 1934, Evelyn published Prodigal Days, The Untold Story. The book was part autobiography and confession that relived the days of New York and Broadway at the dawn of the 20th century. It was filled with anecdotes about show business, of carriage rides, dinners at Rector's and Delmonico's, and of all-night parties where the champagne never stopped flowing. She spoke candidly about the scandal, leaving out no lurid details. Most of what she described mirrored her testimony, but she focused on correcting several of the lies she told under oath, one being the allegation that she'd been drugged before Stanford White raped her. In the book, she wrote that it never happened. In truth, they both drank too much champagne on that fateful night and things went too far. Furthermore, she said she never screamed after it was done, but had only cried, mostly at the thought of her mother finding out about what they had done. After agreeing to keep it a secret, she said it was the first of many consensual intimate encounters with the architect. Evelyn said she broke off her relationship with White because she was jealous that he paid attention to other chorus girls. She was also painfully aware that she could never be his wife and that it would only be a matter of time before he lost interest in her. It was the realization that sent her over to Harry Thaw. Evelyn wrote how after returning from her first trip to Europe with Harry, she went back to Stanny because she needed his help. She told him about Thaw's marriage proposal and how when she turned him down, he coerced her to tell him everything she and White had done together. Now she feared that he planned to use the information to get him in trouble. White reassured her that there was nothing to worry about and arranged for her to meet with attorney Abe Hummel to swear out an affidavit against Thaw. It was the same affidavit she claimed was a forgery and had denied any knowledge of at the trial. But the most difficult lie she told was when District Attorney Jerome asked if she loved Stanford White. His question struck like a bullet fired straight into her heart from Harry Thaw's gun. As she sat on the stand, she could feel Harry's black eyes upon her, waiting to hear the answer that his legal dream team had instructed her to give. Sobbing openly, Evelyn replied that she did not love Stanford White, that she hated him. Afterward, she hated herself for doing it, but her testimony had moved the first jury enough that in the end, they could not reach a consensus to convict Harry. Evelyn said that during the trial, Delphin Delmas rigorously staged managed her every utterance and nuance, both in court and out. He taught her to spin lies with the truth so well that sometimes even she didn't know the difference. But when it came to Stanford White, there was only one truth, and after 20 years, there was no reason to keep her feelings hidden. There's something I want everyone to understand. Harry thought killed the only man I ever loved. In Prodigal Days, she described the moments following the murder. While pandemonium erupted in the rooftop theater, Evelyn could only see the empty chair that Stanford White had been sitting in moments before. The image burned into her memory and was evocative of the desolation she felt afterwards. She said that a part of herself died with him that night. Evelyn admitted that she never loved Harry Thaw and disclosed for the first time that he was a cocaine addict who could be tender one moment and then a raving lunatic the next. She said he was incapable of intimacy unless he was inflicting pain or fear. She recounted an instance where he had beaten her in a manner startlingly similar to what Fred Gump had gone through. But despite everything Harry had done, Evelyn could not bring herself to hate him. She testified on his behalf because she believed he was mentally ill, and it would have been a far greater sin to allow him to die in the electric chair. 
The most controversial aspect of Evelyn's book was its attempt to repair Stanford White's reputation. She criticized his friends and associates for abandoning him. She called them hypocrites and cowards who ran for cover out of fear that their own dirty secrets would be exposed. She regretted what the scandal had done to his wife and to his son who was the only member of White's family to attend his funeral and sit in at his killer's trial. Speaking for herself, she said, Men can be such beasts, but Stanford White was a brilliant, kind, and fascinating man. After I forgave him, he showed me a world of art and beauty that I had never dreamed possible. She hoped that the public would also forgive him, but it wasn't to be. White's reputation as a predatory rapist had been established before the first trial began. Afterward, there was a conscious effort to erase his name from the collective memory. Many of his architectural masterpieces were considered garish or obsolete. Some had fallen under the wrecking ball. Even Madison Square Garden, which became a symbol of depravity and murder, was demolished in 1925. Over the years, Evelyn's own reputation became tarnished by accusations that she acted as a scheming vixen, setting her two lovers against each other. But in fact, a mutual hatred had existed between Stanford White and Harry Thaw long before she entered the picture. If Evelyn could be said to be guilty of anything, it was for being a naive teenager who was inadvertently swept into a blood feud between two older and worldlier men. By the time Prodigal Days was published, Delphin Delmas and William Travers Jerome were both dead, negating any chance for a backlash or rebuttal, which might have helped book sales. Despite having all the right ingredients of a hit, the book did not make a big splash. By then, the Thaw White tragedy paled in comparison to fresh scandals that landed on newsstands with stunning regularity. It would take Hollywood another 20 years to get around to adapting it for the silver screen. And when they did, the girl on the red velvet swing turned out to be a commercial and critical flop that became a late show mainstay on television. There would be other movies made that dramatically wove the story into the broader narrative of the American experience. Books, both fact and fiction, continue to be published to this very day, trying to decipher a greater meaning in what William Travers Jerome called a common tenderloin murder. As the years slowly gained on her, Evelyn stopped trying to make sense out of what happened. She made her peace with the ghosts of the past and did not harbor resentment or regret. In the darkest days of her life, she found a new form of self-expression and sculpture. She said that working with clay was hell on her hands, but was healing to her soul. She sculpted late into life, with many of her works depicting youthful girls on the cusp of womanhood. And although she never identified them as such, her creations can be viewed as self-portraits. It was as if she was subconsciously trying to recapture a moment before she lost her innocence. An interviewer once asked if she would like to live her life over again. Without hesitating, Evelyn said she didn't have to because she already lived it, and that was enough. Then, with more irony than pathos, she added, Stanny was the lucky one because he died. Me, I lived and had to suffer. On January 17, 1967, Evelyn Florence Nesbitt passed away in her sleep at age 82. She had once been the most famous person in the world who was more readily identifiable by the American public than First Lady Edith Roosevelt. Yet six decades later, her funeral mass was attended by only 30 mourners. Her grave, like those of Harry Thaw and Stanford White, are today quiet places, giving no hint to the passerby of the tumultuous lives they had lived. Looking back across the gulf of time that separates us from the events we just witnessed does not give them greater clarity, nor does it unriddle the eternal question of who was right and who was wrong. We find our heroes and villains where we need them to be, but the difference between the innocent and the guilty is only a matter of perspective. 
And when so few of us have the sight to judge those qualities within ourselves, the question will forever remain unanswered. I'm 